The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Chapter 19, Part 2. For the last few moments, Goodwife Croof had been vehemently prodding her husband. He rose now obediently. Sir, I've summit to say as makes sense, he announced, assuming a bold tone. And there's more than one witness to prove it. I've got some here, as was found in the widow's house that night. With a sinking heart, Kit watched as he drew an object from his pocket. It was not the horn book, as she had expected. It was the little copy book. At sight of it, good wife Kroof's anger burst through all restraints. Look at that, she demanded. What do you say about that? My prudence name written over and over. Tis a spell, that's what it is. A mercy, the child is alive today. Another hour, she'd have been dying like the others. The magistrate accepted the copy book reluctantly, as though it were tainted. Do you recognize this, Miss Tyler? Kit could barely stand upright. She tried to answer, but only a hoarse whisper came out. Speak up, girl, he ordered sharply. Does this book belong to you? Yes, sir, she managed. Did you write this name? Kit could barely swallow. She had vowed she would never deceive her uncle again. Then remembering, she looked back at the copy book. Yes, the name on the first line was in her own hand, large and clear for Prudence to copy. Yes, sir, she said, her voice loud with relief. I wrote the name. Matthew Wood passed a hand over his eyes. He looked old, old and ill, as he had looked that day beside Mercy's bed. Why should you write a child's name over and over like that? I... I can't tell you, sir. Captain Talcott looked perplexed. There are no other child's names here, he said. Why did you choose to write the name of Prudence Kroof? Kit was silent. Mistress Tyler, the magistrate spoke to her directly. I had considered this morning's inquiry merely a formality. I did not expect to find any evidence worthy of carrying to the court. But this is a serious matter. You must explain to us how this child's name came to be written. As Kit looked back at him mutely, the restraints that held the tensely waiting crowd gave way. Men and women leaped to their feet, screaming, She won't answer. That proves she's guilty. She's a witch. She's as good as admitted it. We don't need a jury trial. Put her to the water test. Hanging's too good for her. In the midst of the pandemonium, Gershom Bulkley quietly reached for the copy book, studied it carefully, and turned a shrewd, deliberative eye upon Kit. Then he whispered something to the magistrate. Captain Talcott nodded. Silence, he barked. This is the colony of Connecticut. Every man and woman is entitled to trial before jury. This case will be turned over to general session in Hartford. The inquiry is dismissed. Hold a minute, Captain, called a voice. A commotion near the door had been scarcely noticed. There's a fellow here says he has an important witness for the case. Every voice was suddenly stilled, almost paralyzed with dread. Kit turned slowly to face a new accuser. On the threshold of the room stood Nat Eaton, slim, straight-shouldered, without a trace of mockery in his level blue eyes. Nat! The wave of joy and relief was so unexpected that she almost lost her balance, but almost instantly it drained away and left a new fear. For she saw that beside him, clinging tightly to his hand, was Prudence Cruff. Goodwife Cruff let out a piercing scream. Take her out of here! The witch will put the evil eye on her! She and her husband both started forward. 
Stand back, ordered the magistrate. The child is protected here. Where is the witness? Nat put his hands on the child's shoulders and gently urged her forward. With one trusting look at his face, Prudence walked steadily toward the magistrate's table. Suddenly, Kit found her voice. Oh, please, sir, she cried, the tears rushing down her face. Let them take her away. It is all my fault. I would do anything to undo it if I could. I never meant any harm, but I'm responsible for all of it. Please, take me to Hartford. Do what you want with me, but, oh, I beg you, send Prudence away from this horrible place. The magistrate waited till this outburst was over. "'Tis a trifle late to think about the child,' he said coldly. "'Come here, child.' Kit sank on her knees and buried her face in her hands. The buzz in the room roared like a swarm of bees around her head. Then there was a waiting hush. She could scarcely bear to look at Prudence, but she forced herself to raise her head. The child was barefoot and her snarled hair was uncovered. Her thin arms under the skimpy jumper were blue with cold. Then Kit stared again. There was something strange about Prudence. Will you stand there, child, in front of the table? Captain Talcott spoke reassuringly. Watching Prudence, Kit suddenly felt a queer prickling along her spine. There was something different about her. The child's head was up. Her eyes were fastened levelly on the magistrate. Prudence was not afraid. We will ask you some questions, Prudence, said the magistrate quietly. You will answer them as truthfully as you possibly can. Do you understand? Yes, sir, whispered Prudence. Do you know this young woman? Oh, yes, sir. She's my teacher. She taught me to read. You mean at the dame school? No, I never went to the dame school. Then where did she teach you? At Hannah's house in the meadow. A loud scream from Goodwife Kroof tore across the room. You mean Mistress Tyler took you to Hannah Tupper's house? The first time she took me there. After that, I went by myself. The little weasel, cried Goodwife Kroof. That's where she was all those days. I'll see that girl hung. It is all over, thought Kit, with a wave of faintness. Gershom Volkley still held the little copy book. He spoke now under his breath and passed the book to Captain Talcott. Have you ever seen this book before? The magistrate questioned. Oh, yes, sir. Kit gave it to me. I wrote my name in it. That's a lie, cried Goodwife Kroof. The child is bewitched. Captain Talcott turned to Kit. Is it true, he asked her, that the child wrote her own name in this book? Kit dragged herself to her feet. Tis true, she answered dully. I wrote it for her once, and then she copied it. You can't take her word for anything, sir, protested Goodman Kroof timidly. A child don't know what she's saying. I might as well tell it. Prudence has never been what you'd call bright. She never could learn much. The magistrate paid no attention. Could you write your name again, do you think? I, I think so, sir. He dipped the quill pen carefully in the ink and handed it to the child. Leaning over the table, Prudence set the pen on the copy book. For a moment, there was not a single sound in the room but the hesitant scratching. Goodman Cruff was on his feet, propelled by a curiosity greater than any awe for the magistrate. He came slowly across the room and peered over his child's shoulder. Is that proper writing? He demanded in unbelief. Prudence Cruff, does it say right out as it should? 
The magistrate glanced at the writing and handed the copy book to Gershom Bulkley. Very proper writing, I should say, Dr. Bulkley commented, for a child with no learning. The magistrate leaned to take the pen out of the small fingers. Goodman Kruf tiptoed back to the bench. The bluster was gone from him. He looked dazed. Now, Prudence, the magistrate continued, you say that Mistress Tyler taught you to read? What sort of reading? Good wife Kruf rose in a frenzy. Magic signs and spells, I tell you. The child would never know the difference. Gershom Bulkley also rose to his feet. That, at least, will be easy to prove, he suggested reasonably. What can you read, child? I can read the Bible. Dr. Bulkley picked up the great Bible from the table and turned the pages thoughtfully. Then, moving to hand the book to Prudence, he realized that it was too heavy for her to hold and laid it carefully on the table beside her. Read that for us, child, beginning right there. Kit held her breath. Was it the tick of the great clock that sounded so frighteningly, or her own heart? Then across the silence came a whisper. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, whiz, wisdom and in, in instruction and understanding. The childish voice slowly gained strength and clarity, till it reached every corner of the room. The father of the right righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wish child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. In the warm rush of pride that welled up in her, Kit forgot her fear. For the first time, she dared to look back at Nat Eden, where he stood near the door. Across the room, their eyes met, and suddenly it was as though he had thrown a line straight into her reaching hands. She could feel the pull of it, and over its taut span, strength flowed into her, warm and sustaining. When she finally looked away, she realized that everyone in the room was staring at the two parents. They had both leaned forward, their mouths open in shock and unbelief. As she listened, Goodwife Kruf's face darkened and her eyes narrowed. She saw now that she had been tricked. The fresh anger that was gathering would be vented on her child. On the father's face, a new emotion seemed to be struggling. As the thin voice ended, Goodwife Kruf drew in her breath through her teeth in a venomous hiss. But before she could release it, her husband sprang forward. Did you hear that? He demanded widely of everyone present. All at once, his shoulders straightened. That was really good reading. I'd like to see any boy in this town do better. It's a trick, denied his wife. That child could never read a word in her life. She's bewitched, I tell you. Hold your tongue, woman, shouted her husband unexpectedly. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Prudence being bewitched. All these years you've been telling me our child was half-witted. Why, she's smart as a whip. I bet it weren't much of a trick to teach her to read. Goodwife Kruf's jaw dropped. For a moment, she was struck utterly dumb. And in that moment, her husband stepped into his rightful place. There was a new authority in his voice. Oh, and I see we're running a little long, so we're going to stop here and try and finish this chapter up in the next video. Thank you so much for watching and listening. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.